It is really good to see everybody here today. If you're a visitor meeting with us for the very first time, then I encourage you to fill out a visitor's card. You'll find that in a small rack in the pew in front of you. At the end of our worship today, a couple of our members will go around and collect those for you. We simply want to get in contact with you and find out if you have any spiritual needs at all. That if you'd like to have a Bible study with us, and we'd love to sit down and do that with you. If you're curious about our congregation and what we do and why we do it, we'd also love to open up our Bibles and show you straight from God's Word why that is. Now, if you're familiar with college football at all, then you understand that it is Rivalry Week. Rivalry Week is the term that we apply to the last week of the regular season when traditional rivals finally get to play each other. And it goes by a lot of different names. Some people call it the Iron Bowl, and some people call it their Civil War, and other people call it the Territorial Cup. Usually there's something at stake. Sometimes it's a spot in a championship game. Or maybe it's just pride and bragging rights for the next year. Maybe it's a silly trophy like Paul Bunyan's axe. But whatever you call it or whatever is at stake, rivalry, rivalry week tends to bring out the same thing in people, which is rivalry. And isn't it ironic this time of year when we're celebrating holidays and celebrating family that families get together so that they can divide over sports? Now this sense of rivalry can manifest itself in religion as well. And you can go to almost any small town in America, I might even say every small town in America, and on one side of the road there will be this kind of church, and on the other side of the road there will be that kind of church. And their marquees are always offering the truth, that we believe the truth, we are the only true church, come here on Sunday. And in these small towns and in the big cities, almost anywhere you go in America, there's almost like a football team mentality that exists in churches. Where it's you've got the Baptist church on one side and the Methodist church on the other side, and a church of Christ down the road and a Lutheran church the other direction. And in these towns and cities across America, people say, well, what church do you go to? Oh, I go to this church. Ah, oh, you're on the wrong team then. And then you meet somebody at the grocery church and say, well, what church do you go to? Well, I go to the same one you do. Well, that's great. Then you're on the right team. You might meet somebody on an airplane and start talking about religion. The subject tends to come up, doesn't it? And they mention to you that they're a part of this religious group. And it's the same religious group that you are. So you give each other a high five and say, hey, same religion. And it's almost like it's my team and it's your team. And if you're not on the right team, you're on the losing team. And in a way, in a way that's right. But the mentality that exists of my church and your church, my religion and your religion, it almost has that football rivalry feel to it. And I believe that it feeds into one of the great questions that struggling Christians tend to have. Which is if we're on the right path, if we're in the right church, if we believe the truth, then what is God going to do about all those people who disagree with me? And sometimes that question prods us to ask further questions and to study and to come up with an answer and it bolsters our faith. But I'm finding more and more, and perhaps your experience is the same, that I'm finding more and more that that question most often leads to spiritual shipwreck in people's lives. They look at all of their religious friends who disagree with them on a great many doctrinal and theological points, all of which are important, and they look at all the people who disagree with them and all the people in different religions and different denominations of different religions and different sects of different denominations of different religions, and they go... How can God possibly condemn all of them? How is it possible that I'm right and the rest of the world is so wrong? So in response, they'll give up entirely. I'm not going to believe anymore. I'm not going to be a part of anything anymore. And again, again, that more often than not seems to be one of the great questions that trips people up in their spiritual walk. Maybe another way of putting it is, when we talk about the narrow way, perhaps the way just feels a little too narrow for us. 
So it is very tempting for us to become preoccupied with the troubling question of our friends and family members and their various spiritual conditions. After all, if we really do care about them, then we ought to be concerned. If in any way at all we believe that we know something important, that we know the truth about something, that we know the way to salvation, then if we care about people, we will share that truth with them. Go to Luke chapter 19 and notice here in Luke 19 verse 10. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And whether you're talking about Jesus talking to Zacchaeus, Or you're talking about you having a conversation with that family member that you have always known needs to happen. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost, and we have to have the same attitude. You go back a few chapters into chapter 15 of Luke, and you notice three parables that Jesus offers. One where a man loses one of his sheep. Another where a woman loses a coin in her house. And another where a man loses his son to the ways of the world and prodigal living. And in all three of those parables, in some way or another, whether they're searching, whether they're seeking, or whether they're simply waiting patiently at home with arms open wide, there's still a desire for the thing that is lost to bring it back home, to return it to where it needs to be. So if we know the truth and we love the people around us, then we should be concerned about their spiritual condition. That should permeate our conversations and our activities and our engagement with people. But does the concern lead us to act upon it or just to ask questions? Because that's what tends to happen. People sit there and they wonder, well, what's God going to do about this religious group? And what's God going to do about that religious group? And is God really going to judge and send people to hell just because they're ignorant or misinformed or don't know or couldn't know? And so the question doesn't lead us to do anything. It doesn't motivate us to fix anything or change anything or talk to anybody. The question just leads us to become discouraged and give up. We indulge in being bothered by all of our differences, even to the point of despair and spiritual crisis. But that concern only manifests itself in the desire to somehow ignore, justify, or conform to the false teaching that we know to be false. Simply put, God never asks us to render eternal judgment for anybody. All God asks us to do is engage with them. To just engage. It's not my job to say who's going to heaven and hell. I don't get that final say. I don't sit on the judgment seat of Christ. It is not my sovereign place to come to that conclusion. All God has asked me to do is to go into a lost world, which He acknowledges is a lost world, and to preach the gospel to all mankind. To preach it to anybody who will listen. To preach a message that is nothing but good news for those who want to be saved. That's it. Not to judge, but to engage. So what will God do with those who are misinformed and misguided? What will God do with people who have good motives? What is God going to do with people who are ignorant? What is God going to do with people who were simply misguided or were in a religion where they were taught something false? What is God going to do with all those people during the Dark Ages who were illiterate and were depending on the teaching of local priests in the Catholic Church to guide them in religious ways? Being illiterate, they couldn't have known any differently. What is God going to do with those people? What is God going to do with those who are really close to the truth, who seem to agree with the Bible in a lot of ways, and agree with you, and that more often than not seems to be kind of what you're judging it. They tend to agree with me on most things. But what is God going to do with people who are really close to the truth, but just not quite there? And we want to know, don't we? That's how people's brains work. We want to categorize everything. I want to know, does it work or does it not work? How much money is in my bank account? How can I identify and categorize all the animals on planet Earth? What's their class and their family and their, you know, I don't know all of them. There's some, you know, memory device that you're supposed to use that they taught me in grade school and I don't remember it. I'm not a scientist. 
But we want to categorize everything, don't we? We want things in nice, tidy, uh, nice, tidy columns where these are the people who are saved, and I know it, and these are the people who are not saved, and I know that as well, and I want to feel good about that and feel comfortable about that. But we can't. And that's my answer. When people ask me, I give them the same answer every time. Hey, Ryan, what is God going to do about fill-in-the-blank religious group? Because they do a lot of things well, and they're really nice people, but they're just misguided about something. My answer is, I don't know. And I can't know. I don't know, and I can't know. But the thing about it is, is I'm not allowed. The Bible does not allow me. The Bible does not allow me to indulge in fantasy. The Bible doesn't allow me to sit there in my office, put my feet up and go, you know, I think that so-and-so is going to be saved. Or I hope that so-and-so is going to be saved, and they probably will be. Or, the Bible doesn't allow me to indulge in rationalizing or philosophizing or willing or theorizing anybody into or out of salvation. I'm not allowed to do that by the Bible. And I'll give you a couple of Bible passages that illustrate that. In Mark chapter 12, for example, notice here this story in Mark chapter 12. <clears throat> Pick up here in verse 34. Now remember here, the, the setup to it is that back in verse 28, one of the scribes who was hearing them arguing with Jesus recognized that Jesus was speaking nothing but truth. And this scribe admired Jesus and, and had a question for him. So he asked him the question of, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus answers his question. And the scribe, again, is very impressed by that, that you've truly stated this, he says in verse 32. Now here in verse 34, recognizing this, when Jesus saw that he had answered intelligently, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one would venture to ask him any more questions. But here's the thing I want to get at. Not far from the kingdom of God is still not in the kingdom of God. And as much as we want to, again, theorize or rationalize or just kind of will somebody into salvation, because surely God wouldn't condemn that person, as much as we want to theorize about that and stroke our beards, the fact is, not far from the kingdom of God is still not in the kingdom of God. You might be not far. You might be very close to the kingdom of God. But if you're not in the kingdom of God, you're not in the kingdom of God. Not far is not close enough. Philippians chapter 3. Here in Philippians chapter 3, Paul is going to go back on his own personal experiences and explain a little bit of what it was like before he became a Christian. And the thinking that went through his mind here, beginning in verse 2. Beware of the dogs, he says. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of false circumcision. For we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and of glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. You notice here that when it comes to the truth, Paul, Paul didn't have any issue at all. He, he didn't have any problem saying, we are the true circumcision. And if you're not the true circumcision, then you're not the true circumcision. That, that there, was no, there was no issue he had with that of kind of like going back and forth and jumping around and trying to philosophize his way out of it of if you're not the true circumcision, you're not the true circumcision. But he goes on to say here in verse 4, although I myself might have had confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. So you could look at Paul's life before he was a Christian, and by the standard that he knew in his mind, by the standard that he believed he was going to be judged by, by the standard that he believed was God's standard, but was not in fact God's standard in the New Covenant. But by the standard that he thought was the right standard, he said, I was blameless. I was doing everything right. I was doing everything right. And yet even the person who is found blameless by the standard that he believes is the right one, Upon reflection, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 16, upon reflection, he said, I was still a sinner. 
I was still a sinner. I acted ignorantly in unbelief. His ignorance was not an excuse, though. His ignorance did not excuse him for what he did. Even though he was ignorant of the fact that he was sinning by persecuting the church, he was still sinning by persecuting the church. But third, in Acts chapter 18, and I'm sure you're familiar with it because we just studied it in our Bible classes very recently, but in Acts chapter 18, we meet a man named Apollos who is described in the Scriptures as being mighty in the Scriptures. Very intelligent person from Alexandria. That means something, by the way. Alexandria was a center of education and knowledge. There was a great library there. There was a, there was a huge Jewish community that lived there. That They had a quarter of the city that was their own part of the city. So the fact that Apollos was from Alexandria, that he was educated, very intellectual, he knew the Scriptures, or so he thought. And he was confronted because he was not preaching something correctly. Now, would anybody doubt Apollos' motives? Does anybody doubt his motives? Does anybody doubt his intellect? But even with great motives and a whole lot of smarts to back you up, when you're wrong, you're wrong. And Apollos was wrong about baptism. He was wrong about it. What God chooses to do with well-meaning but misinformed religious people is entirely up to Him. It is not my place to come to that judgment. He doesn't need my help deciphering motives. He doesn't need my help separating the saved from the unsaved. I think that's an important point to make also. That no matter how much we want to rationalize it, of well, you know, this is kind of the line. If I was God, I, th these are the people that I would let into heaven and these are the people I wouldn't. You know, God kind of looks at that. I imagine God looks at that and goes, I've got this handled. Thank you. But I think I can handle this myself. In fact, a parable in, Mark, in Matthew chapter 13 even points this out. This parable explains the way that a person had planted some seed, right? He planted good seed. There was good seed in the soil there. But one of his enemies put weeds in there as well, or tares is what some translations say. He mixed some wheat or mixed some weeds in with the wheat, and when they both grew up together, the servants realized, Master, you've got an enemy who sabotaged you. You've got tares or weeds mixed in with your wheat. Do you want us to go through and separate them out? And the master says, No, no, no. I'll handle that. You let them grow up together. And at the end of the harvest, or when the harvest time arrives, at the end of the growing season, the reapers will come and they'll separate them out. And you notice that the servants and the reapers are two different groups of people. The servants want to come and say, hey, do you want us to handle this problem over here? And the master says, nope, I've got reapers who know what they're doing. We'll allow them to both grow up together and we'll let the reapers handle that. And they'll separate them. And I think one point from this text is we, from our human perspective, are inadequate. We are unable and we are not qualified to separate the wheat from the weeds, at least as far as final judgment goes. Now, can you tell the difference between a weed and a wheat? Sure you can. Of course you can. But as far as final judgment goes, we're not qualified to make the call of this person saved and this person's not saved. We're not qualified. The Lord knows those who are His, according to 2 Timothy chapter 2. In fact, I want to read that verse because the second half of the verse really brings out what our responsibility is. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, in verse 19, it says, Nevertheless, the firm foundation of God stands, having this seal. The Lord knows those who are His. And we have to let that be that. The Lord knows those who are His. He knows who's saved and who's not. He knows. Now, we're so bad at it because I can't get into anybody's thoughts. I can't get into their soul. I don't know their motives. Somebody might be going through all the motions. They might be going through the form. And they might look like they're saved. And I might say, well, surely that person is saved because they look like they're saved. But maybe you're a hypocrite. Maybe you do it in pretense. I don't know. God does, though. The Lord knows those who are His. So it's his responsibility to know those who are his. What's my responsibility? What's my job then? The Lord knows those who are his and let everyone who names the name of the Lord abstain from wickedness. That's my job. God knows those who are his. My job 
is to name the name of the Lord, which I believe is preaching and teaching, to proclaim the name of the Lord. It is my job to name the name of the Lord and abstain from wickedness. Now, I can control that. I can't control whether you actually believe or you're a hypocrite. I can't control that. But I can control, am I preaching? And am I living it? Am I naming the name? And am I walking the walk? I can control that. The third point along these lines is we need to learn to become very comfortable with God's sovereignty while His incredible and unfathomable grace touches our lives, we need to let it touch other lives as God judges. Or as Romans chapter 9 puts it, I will be merciful on whom I will be merciful, and I'll show compassion to who I want to show compassion. And I don't have any say in that. I don't have any say in that. But God does expect us to have a sense of urgency when it comes to teaching because you might walk away from a lesson at this point thinking, well, okay, then we just don't need to care, right? It doesn't matter then. Uh, everybody's going to believe what they want to believe. You believe your thing, I'll believe my thing. You stay on your side of the road, I'll stay on my side of the road, right? We get back to the whole football team rivalry thing, right? You root for your team, I'll root for my team, and at the end of the game, we'll see who's got the most points. There does have to be a sense of urgency, though, because again, like I said, if we care about people, and if we do believe that we know truth, if we have something to offer people, then we need to offer it. We need to care about people enough to show that. Go to Acts chapter 19. Great example here in Acts chapter 19, where the Apostle Paul could very easily have said, well, unity and diversity, believe what you want to believe, let bygones be bygones. He comes to the city of Ephesus at the beginning of Acts chapter 19. And he found some people who were believers. It describes them as disciples in verse 1. Disciple simply means a student, somebody who's pursuing something, somebody who's following a teacher. So they were disciples of Christ, but does that mean that they were Christians? Were they saved? Did they have a complete knowledge of what it meant to be a Christian? And he asked them, did you ever receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no, in verse 2. We have not even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And, you know, that's a big piece of the pie that you're missing. That if, if, if you think you can be a Christian, but you don't even know if there is such a thing as a Holy Spirit, I just, I don't know if you can call yourself a Christian at that point, because that's a big piece of the pie that you're just kind of not even understanding at all, that, that you're not even factoring in. And he said, well, into what then were you baptized? He's, see, he's starting to peel the layers away, isn't he? One question leads to another, and, and the questions get deeper and deeper. Well, into what then were you baptized? They said, well, into John's baptism. And that made perfect sense to them, because if that's all that they knew, that John baptized people as a baptism of repentance to turn their hearts back toward God, well, okay, then, uh, you know, that's what we're familiar with. Which leads Paul to wonder then... <coughs> Well, what are we supposed to do with you? Is there a functional difference between the baptism of John and the baptism into Christ? Well, the Bible clearly defines John's baptism as a repentance baptism. It's a baptism that says, I'm sorry for everything I've done. I'm going to turn my heart back toward God now. That's what it is. It's an act of penitence. It's something you do that says, I'm sorry I'm repenting and turning back to God. But the baptism into Christ is different. Because Romans chapter 6 connects the baptism into Christ with His death, burial, and resurrection. That when you are baptized with Christ, Romans 6 says, you are baptized with Him into death and raised up with Him into life. John's baptism didn't do that. John's baptism didn't wash your sins away either. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38, repent, which he sees as a separate thing, right? Where John would have said the baptism is like the repentance, now bring forth, bring forth fruits, in, fruits in keeping with it. Peter says you've got to repent and then be baptized for the remission of all your sins. They're two different things. So Paul then teaches them more clearly about baptism by saying John baptized with the baptism of repentance telling the people to believe in Him who was coming after Him, that is, in Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And you notice the attitude that they had. Paul had a sense of urgency because he realized 
these people have not been baptized in the body of Christ. They haven't had their sins washed away. And everybody else had a sense of urgency rather than a sense of pride or arrogance or traditionalism. And they said, well, that's not how we've always heard it. That's not what we've always believed. That's not what somebody else taught us. That's not what we want to believe or what's convenient for us. They said, well, if that's the truth, then that's the truth. And if that's the truth, then we accept it wholeheartedly. And there's that sense of urgency that you have to have when it comes to these things. Well, how can we be the only ones that are saved then? I don't know how many times I've heard people ask that. So Ryan, are you saying that we're the only people going to be saved? That we're the only people who know any truth at all? That we're the only people who understand the God? Are you really saying that we are the only people going to be saved? Why do you ask a question like that? Because at the end of the day, does that question matter at all? The question that is asked of you is not who is going to be saved, but are you going to be saved? That's the question that needs to be asked. Are you saved? Are you saved? And not only that, I want to know who's even making this claim? Like, who, who's even saying that we, our football team, is the only one that's going to be saved? Who's even making that claim? I always wondered that. Like, I just, I don't know if I hear that a lot anymore from people. I just don't know if I hear that a lot from people anymore. Who's really making that claim? Because we need to be careful not to act just as denomination as any other denomination. It's not us versus them. It's not our team. It's not if our team wins, then everybody else's team loses. So God is going to judge how He's going to judge based on how people respond to the Gospel. And if somebody responds to the Gospel in the way that He has prescribed... He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. You think God knows how to save that person? He sure does. We just got we have to change our mentality on this. Get out of this mode of thinking. Remember that everybody has equal access to all the truth. So this idea of are you saying that we're the only ones who have the truth? That's a ridiculous statement. Anybody who's ever slept in a motel room had access to the truth and all of it. It's not like there were a couple of like 19th century Scottish coots who discovered some secret magic decoder ring about baptism, right? Alexander Campbell and his dad didn't just like wake up one night with some vision and they, you know, they saw the flux capacitor or something and went, aha, it's baptism. If you had a Bible in your hands for the last 2,000 years, then you could have read Mark 16, 16 at any point. Nobody made up Mark 16.16. 16. The idea of belief and baptism are what saves you. Nobody made that up. Okay, it wasn't just some 19th century Scotsman who just made up one day this new way to get saved. It's not that we are the only ones who have all the truth. It is that anybody who has this in their hands, anybody who has the Bible has all the truth because Jesus promised that His disciples would have all the truth in John 16, verse 13. The Holy Spirit would bring to your remembrance not part of it, not some of it, not a little bit of it or just the good parts. The Holy Spirit would bring to your remembrance all the truth. You have all the truth. The problem is not that we don't all have the truth. The problem is human traditions that get in the way where somebody reads Mark 16, 16, or Acts 2, verse 38, and it says to believe and be baptized for salvation. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of your sins. And somebody reads it and says, well, but that's not what I've heard. Or that's not what I've always believed. Or that's not what my influential pastor told me. That's the issue, isn't it? It's not a lack of access to all the truth. It's a lack of interest in dropping human traditions and human doctrines and simply believing the simple truth about it. I mean, the thing about baptism is anybody, anybody can Google the word baptism and say baptism in Greek and see baptizo and see that it is a word that means to immerse something fully. Anybody can do that. So when you compare your human tradition of sprinkling babies or pouring water over somebody's head and look at the word baptism... All you have to do is realize sprinkling water on a baby is not the same thing as fully immersing a consenting adult into salvation. Those are not the same things. Like that, I'm sorry, that you don't have to have a magic decoder ring to know that. 
That, that's not some great giant mystery that somebody accidentally stumbled across one day. And if you really do believe something is the truth, then why shouldn't you be willing to defend it as exclusive? I question that also. When people say, well, are you saying that, that you guys are right and everybody else is wrong? Well, first of all, I'm not saying that. But second of all, I'm not sure that I would want to be part of a religion that said everybody was right. I mean, if you believe that something is the truth, then stand up for it as the truth. And be willing to stand up for it as the truth. Be willing to take a stand for something. Be willing to take a stand for something. Well, I know that we're about out of time here, but I want to give you three quick tips on how to engage with people around you, religious friends and family members. Ways that you can keep the conversation going and have things be productive so that it doesn't just end with, yeah, well, my team's going to heaven and your team's going to hell, which is about the most unproductive thing that you can possibly say. And unfortunately, I say that jokingly, but unfortunately... That is how most religious conversations go with people. Isn't there a better way to talk about religion? Isn't there a better way to talk about spiritual things and church and theology? Isn't there a more productive way that we can engage with people rather than just shutting it down right away by saying, well, if you don't agree with me, then I guess you're wrong and going to hell. Well, how about this? Try dialogue without judgment. Ask questions about what people believe and what they practice. Ask them to explain it. And be really careful. Don't assume that a person always agrees with everything that their denomination or that their church believes. And we tend to do that, don't we? we? Oh, you're a Mormon? I heard you guys believe all this wacky stuff. You might actually find out that the average Mormon might not believe all that wacky stuff. Oh, you're a Baptist? That means you're a Calvinist too, right? Not every Baptist is a Calvinist. Oh, you guys are Baptists? I heard that you guys do instrumental music. Well... You know, not every Baptist church does instrumental music. It's amazing how we, we hear what someone is and we have like this instant reaction of, oh, you're that? Well, that must mean you believe this. That's a real quick way to shut a conversation down, by the way. You will shut somebody's heart down just as quickly as if somebody says, oh, you guys are Church of Christ? That means you guys believe in magic water and you hate music. Just imagine putting the shoe, right? Put the shoe on the other person and how would it feel if you assumed all of their beliefs based on very scant information or assumptions that you've made about somebody else's religion? Let somebody else explain what they believe. And then together, ask questions about that. That's interesting. So that's how you guys baptize in your church. Oh, that's interesting. I, I, uh, this is how we baptize in our congregation. Here's a couple passages that we use to help explain why we do it this way. That's all you've got to do, Right? That's engagement without judgment. It's conversation. It's dialogue. Second, don't be the one to shut the communication down. Instead of, instead of stomping off and being angry with other people, say something like this. You know, I love talking about the Bible, even with people who disagree with me. I just love talking about the Bible with people. Can we do this again sometime? You know, I'd love to come back and readdress that interesting thing that you said before, but let's take a couple days to study on our own and then we can come back and talk about this thing again. Don't be the one to shut it down and just say, well, I guess that's that. I've washed my hands of you. Great example of that is in Acts chapter 24, verse 24, on through the end of the chapter, where Paul encounters a man named Felix who kind of who strings him along for like two and a half years, thinking that he's going to get a bribe from Paul the whole time. And instead, these are like Bible studies and pretense. Paul knew that. Paul's not stupid. He, he knows what's going on. And yet, here's Paul for two years studying. Hey, if Felix wants to study, I don't care if he's here for pretense or for a bribe. If he's going to study, I'll open up my Bible and study with him. Don't be the one to shut the conversation down. And remember who the enemy is, okay? Your friends and family members, people in other religions, people who disagree with you, they're not the enemy. Satan is the enemy. It's false ideas that are being perpetuated by doctrines of demons, as it's put in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. That's the enemy. Don't take things personally in conversations about religion. Don't get defensive. And don't give them reasons to be defensive either. Remember who the enemy is. And when you're debating things like people's doctrines or their practices or their beliefs, debate the origin of it. <laughs> debate the practice itself. Debate the belief itself. Don't debate the person or their motives. Debate the thing. 
not the person. I think we might have more productive conversations if we can follow a few of those things. Now, if you're not a Christian here this morning, you really ought to be. The Gospel really is that simple. It really is that simple. That if you believe Jesus is the Son of God and you're willing to confess that belief before others, and if you're willing to put a life of sin behind you and resolve to live for Him each and every day, and if you will be baptized, which is God's work being done to you. Not a work you do for yourself. Not something meritorious. But God washing you in the waters of baptism. Cleansing you of all of your sins. Then you are a Christian if you can do all those things. So whatever spiritual need you might have, please let it be known by coming forward as we stand and sing. God call.